Good evening. Thank you for joining us for today's roundtable, What's Your Speciality? This is the third in the series of roundtable sponsored by the American University of Antigua, featuring our esteemed alumni, and is dedicated to giving you, the audience, a chance to hear from the alumni about the reasons they are in the speciality, how they got there, and what would they change if they could change the one thing. My name is Parprem Kumar. I'm the advisor to the president for special projects at the American University of Antigua. Today's discussion, what's your speciality? From surgery to family medicine, to cardio, to anesthesia, once you start your made for medicine journey, how do you decide where to land? Today, we will try and break down a few of the specialities we offer, highlighting our alumni who have gone on to become practicing physicians within fields and how they chose their path. We're very excited to introduce you to our alumni, but before we get started, a little housekeeping. If you have any questions for the panel, please type them into the comments and I will bring them up during our session. Now let's meet our panelists, shall we? So let's start with Dr. Basit Rahim. He graduated from AUA in 2014. Basit, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi guys, uh, thank you, Parm. So um, I did graduate 2014. I didn't realize how far that uh, along that was. Uh, it's been a long journey. I uh, did my, um, actually after residency, I did, uh, sorry, after medical school, I did a, a year of research prior to getting into neurology. And then um, in, I did a four year neurology residency, then did my critical care, neurocritical care and stroke fellowships at Stanford. And then uh, took the job currently I'm in right now as a medical director for stroke and critical care um, at, at Providence Health. Okay. Very nice. And and he's in sunny California. California, yes. Uh, Orange County. Orange County. Right. That's right. And then we come up with Dr. Samantha Barr, a 2018 AUA graduate. Samantha, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am currently a pulmonary and critical care doctor in Louisville. Um, after medical school, I matched at my first choice for internal medicine at Cooper University Hospital. Nice. And I did three years there. Then after that, I matched at my first choice for um, pulmonary and critical care at the University of Rochester in upstate New York. Then I decided to take a job in Louisville because we were looking in like the midst of a pandemic and the weather was a lot better here than in upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> the lifestyle was better. So now I'm at um, a community-based hospital in Louisville called Norton Healthcare. It's the biggest healthcare system in Louisville. And I do a combination of um, critical care, interventional pulmonology, and um, inpatient and outpatient pulmonary. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Boy, you moved from Lu yeah. to Louisville yeah. to New York. Okay. <laughs> Were you when while you were in Rochester? Did you know Dr. Schwartz? Dr. Schwartz. Seymour Schwartz. He was our provost. I don't know. I don't think. Okay, so. he was in Rochester. He passed away, unfortunately. Oh no. We miss him terribly, but uh, yeah. So we come to our final panelist, Dr. Christy Thomas, a 2020 grad. Tell us, Christy, how's it been? It's been good so far. I just graduated from AUA just a year ago now, um, and I'm now finishing up my first year of emergency medicine residency. Um, I'm a resident at St. Joseph's Medical Center in Stockton, California. Um, I grew up in California and knew I really wanted to do residency here, so I was really happy to match up my first choice program. Um, and it's been a great experience, a little bit weird starting residency in the midst of a pandemic, True. Um, but it's been, yeah. a, it's been a great experience so far. Fantastic, fantastic. Yes, I think, uh, you know, you jumped right into the fire, didn't you? Yeah, so, as soon as I started is when we started to get our first wave out here in California. So oh, it was no. literally right at the beginning for me. Oh boy, okay. <laughs> and that too, with, uh, you know, critical care, I'm sure you were right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. So um, one of the questions that you know we get asked as uh, you know as faculty and admin is how do you research the speciality and how do you make up your mind that this is what you want to do for the rest of your life? Uh, did you look at the percentage of residency placements that international medical graduates get? Or, you know, or, or how, when do you decide this? And let me throw this open. But let's, let's go with Sam. Let's start with you. Um, so the way that I decided, while I was an undergrad, um, even before medical school, I wanted to be a gastroenterologist. I just thought that's what I wanted to do. So I knew I had to go the internal medicine route. Lucky for me, when I looked at all the statistics, people match in internal medicine um, far more likely when they graduated from a foreign medical institution. So I thought that my chances of going the IM route um, <clears throat> was the best sort of case scenario for me. Um, so that's sort of how I picked internal medicine. And then in terms for pulmonary and critical care, I, um, I think I did a pulmonary rotation as an internal medicine resident, and I really, really loved it. I just thought pulmonary right. was just awesome. Like you get to practice a lot of different subspecialties of medicine. You have to know a lot about pulmonary, but also have to be very knowledgeable about all the other cardiology, GI, rheumatology, because it's kind of all tied into like the sure. lung. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then you also get to do procedures. Um, and I, I just love it. And then the ICU, it was just like, my personality just fits with that. You get to build relationships with certain, you know, family members and patients and just taking care of patients when they're most vulnerable and just critically ill. And I just really, really love my job. I never feel like I'm burnt out or, you know, Right. Some days I don't even feel like I'm going to work. I just feel like I'm I'm doing what I was meant to do. And I know that sounds really, you know, cheesy, but I <laughs> no, I really, really, really love my right. job. Right. Yeah. And I think I think that's half the battle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you, you know, you really gotta love what you do in whatever field you're in, but more so in medicine. Exactly. You really gotta love what you do. Yeah. So so Bassett. I know, uh, you know, when when you graduated, we didn't have as many options. You were, IMGs were still looked at very skeptically. How did you decide on your speciality? Well, yeah, you're right. Back uh, in 2014, there's not a lot of uh, options back then. You, what I did was you take your, you know, step one score and you, you look at all the, you know, online forums and see where people would match with your similar scores and, and where which programs were IMG friendly or which which specialties are IMG friendly. That definitely, you know, you don't want to go to orthopedics or something like that, that, you know, they're not IMG friendly. Reality wise, you have to pick according to what your best chances are and guide your interest with that, with your scores. So with me, neurology was something that I really liked um, during my rotations and something that I, with my scores, I think I could, you know, potentially reach for. And to solidify it, actually, did the year research to help with all that. So that's how I picked my residency based off of what realistically what I would be able to get with my options. So I did look into internal medicine, looked look into pediatrics, and did look into uh, neurology and uh, uh, and then basically neurology was something that I, I grew a passion for, actually. Very nice. Very nice. Yes, you did take a slightly longer route, but I guess at that time we really didn't have much options and you had to do what you had to do to get to where you had to go. You, you have to make yourself competitive and uh, whichever route you have to take, even if you have to take another six months, you just have to do it. So, Christy, you heard from both the veterans on this, on this panel. Um, you obviously, you know, times have changed. IMGs are still, you know, SBS, we still face some skepticism, but it's getting better. How did you decide on your, your you know, final goal? Yeah, I think it is definitely getting better now, and it's getting easier for IMGs to go into specialties. 
Um, and I had it maybe a little bit easier since I just graduated last year. Um, in our last few matches, we've had a lot of our medical students match into a lot of specialties. Um, I essentially walked into medical school knowing, knowing that I wanted to go into emergency medicine. Yeah. Um, I've wanted to do it since I was really young. Uh, my dad was a paramedic firefighter, so I kind of grew up around EMS and emergency oh, very medicine. Nice. And it's just loved it forever. Um, so I, I essentially knew what I wanted to do. And because of that, I was able to talk with different alumni who had already graduated and matched into EM to kind of see what made them competitive, um, talk with other residents when I was rotating to see what made them competitive. And just all throughout medical school did my best to make my application really competitive specific to emergency medicine so it kind of looked like I put all my eggs in one basket but I really knew what I wanted to do and it ended up working out for me that's super I'm so glad it worked out for you mm -hmm. so so tell me before you went into med school or during the time you were doing your uh, you know whatever did you did you ever go and volunteer you know because because your father was a paramedic and stuff did you volunteer yeah when I was in college, actually, I volunteered in a really small, like 12 bed emergency room uh, down in San Diego, nice. where I went to college and I loved it there. Um, we have a really big team aspect to what we do. And that was really exemplified in that when I was volunteering there and I just absolutely loved it. Um, and so that, that really helped to solidify why I was going to go into emergency medicine, you know, kind of building on my foundation. Um, and I've just, I've loved the last year. I mean, intern year, they say is like one of the hardest years of your life and yes. I've just loved it and it's flown by and it, you know, despite the pandemic, I don't really feel burnt out so far and I'm just, I'm loving every second of it. That's absolutely, you know, it, it's very heartening for us on this side of the fence. We are all, we are admin, we are faculty and it's very heartening for us when we realize and talk to, talk to our alumni who say, you know what i am where i wanted to be and we're sort of like okay we're doing something right yay <laughs> so bassett let me ask you a question um and i'm and i'm going to a little bit go out on the edge over here so were there specific programs or um offerings that you looked at which were motivated by diversity uh diversity Yes, actually. So, you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the international programs that would take um, IMGs were pretty diverse. So uh, talking to your community, talking to where um, where your colleagues have you know matched, right. you, you create a path according to that. But diversity does play a big role in where you actually end up. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Sam, did you did you have the same experience? Um, yeah, I I had the same experience. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So three, all three of you, how many programs did you do you think on an average you considered, um, and how many did you apply to? Well, for me, for internal medicine, I knew as an international grad we had to apply to a significantly more number of programs because it would increase your chances of matching so i i knew geographically where i was okay being so i think i tailored it down to that i remember i printed out the list from i forget what one of those websites are called but i printed out all the internal medicine residency programs in certain states and then i went through those programs and i was like looking at who the current residents were looking to see if i thought i would fit in with the program so and then that's kind of how i tailored where i applied and if i saw that they accepted caribbean grads then i would certainly apply if i saw that none of them were caribbean grads i wasn't applying because i felt no. like it was a waste of money because <laughs> no, no. i didn't think they were caribbean friendly or img friendly um, so I think all in all, I may have applied to like, honestly, I don't remember how many I applied to. It feels like just so long ago, but I think I ended up interviewing at like 16 places, but wow. I know I applied to at least quadruple that amount. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And I, so I, I, I remember exactly how many I applied to. I applied to about 60 because that's all the money I had. <laughs> and then, uh, 
Yeah, so uh, like I I kind of like applied everywhere because I didn't know what kind of response I would get. Yeah. Um, interview about twelve to uh, twelve places so before I picked my my first you know uh, choices and I actually ranked all of them. You don't you don't you know miss out an opportunity to match anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. But that must have felt so good, you know, Bassett, to apply to so many and get 12 interviews. Yeah, I actually didn't know how, how, how much, what the, you know, response would be. So I just applied everywhere. Uh, I over applied, but that's fine. Yeah. That's, that's fine. I mean, yeah, only one is the reason. Yeah, exactly. We kind of have to over apply too as IMGs. I think that's kind of like what we kind of yes. walk into the match yeah. thinking. Um, for EM, I remember when I had applied, there were maybe about 300 programs and I did something similar to what Sam did, like basically looked at all the programs and kind of picked them geographically where I would be okay living. Um, and then I still did apply to some programs that were not particularly IMG friendly just because they were in the location I wanted to be in. Um, but that was, that was basically my method as well. I ended up applying to a hundred on the dots. Um, Ooh, and boy. I think okay. I had, yeah, I think I had about 10 interviews. So, um, okay. it was a pretty good response to that, but I think that's just kind of something we have to walk in knowing that we have to do. And plus, let scared. me add, yeah, let me add a little bit to that. So, you know, residency, I applied everywhere and, um, and, uh, IMG friendly mostly. So for fellowship, um, you know, Stanford was not IMG friendly. And I applied, I was like, okay, it's not $30 apply. I was like, sure, let's do it. And then I got my interview and I flew down there. I, I didn't even think I could get a residency or, or a fellowship in California or practice in California. I was like, okay, I'll get a trip out of it to California. And then ended up that I ended up matching there, got my first choice and then did three fellowships there. So, so you shouldn't limit yourself just because, you know, that is you're, true. You're yeah. I think you should, uh, you know, apply to those places that you do want to go and then be a little bit more realistic as where you should be applying to as well. Yeah, I think, and you know what, I think the main thing is also to have the confidence in yourself that, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get it, you know, and I'm going to apply and I'm going to go for the interview and I'm going to, I'm going to just ace it. You know, you have the confidence in yourself. So, what would uh, now come down to your specialities? Sam, in your speciality, what would you say is the biggest advantage that you feel uh, working in your speciality at the moment? Oh, I think just the, the patient diversity and just having, being able to provide a spectrum of care. I feel like I have the best of both worlds because not only am I an intensivist, but I also do outpatient, inpatient poems and procedures. So I feel like I'm a jack of all trades. I know a little bit about everything. I know a lot about pulmonary and critical care. So I just think it's awesome. I I love I love pulmonary and critical care. Do you do you think there is a do you think there's a, a disadvantage to it as well? Um, yeah, I think, you know, with me doing a lot of interventional pulmonology, I see a lot of patients that are really sick who likely have metastatic lung cancer by the time they get to me. Um, so that could weigh on you over time because a lot of those patients, like I keep a list of all procedures I do. And then some days I log in and it's like, you can tell how many of those patients have died. I mean, it's not for me. It's, it's from, the, you know, their disease. Yeah, yeah. Also in the ICU you know, especially during the pandemic, it wasn't really much we could offer after a certain point with the exception of discussing goals of care. So I feel like you can pretty much try everything and just throw the kitchen sink at patients, but knowing um, when you have to start changing or trying to transition the goals of the care can be, you know, exhausting at times and sometimes talking to certain family members because we want to help them, but sometimes it may not come across as that because there are certain barriers that they put up and sometimes it's just the disconnect. So I think that's a major barrier. And Bassett, you probably, and Chrissy, you guys probably all experience the same thing. When you're taking care of a patient's or a person's family member when they're dying, that's a different beast. Yes. Like, so I feel like it brings out certain 
emotions, certain personality traits, and they all mean well, but I think sometimes you take some of that stuff home or you think about it and I, I wouldn't say it's a disadvantage. I think it will, it teaches you a lot about yourself and a lot about the field that you're in, but um, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Bassett, then you're with Neurocritical and I'm sure, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of advantages to where you are because of your pathway, but I'm sure there are a lot of disadvantages too. Yeah, like Sam said, you know, critical care is is a different beast in its own, yeah. and and it's very rewarding. It's not just you know um, you're here with critically ill patients. Very rewarding at the end of the day when you get somebody out of the ICU. Um, neuro ICU perspective wise, people are very sick. They're coming with TBIs and large strokes, and getting them out of the ICU can be very rewarding. But you see the other aspect where. People are at the, you know, at the end of their life and and it's usually with neurocritical care, it's very sudden. You have a traumatic brain injury or you have uh, a large stroke, which is instant. And convincing family members that their loved one is is dying and, and this is the end, it, it can be very um, hectic, but uh, that's, but that's the, you know, the, that's the aspect of the job that we signed up for, but but you know, when it does pay off, it does pay off well from patient satisfaction or patient outcome perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's very satisfying. Like you said, when you move somebody out of ICU, uh, you know, it's you feel that this is this is what I'm meant to do. This is what I should be doing. And Christy, I mean, you're you're still new to emergency medicine, and you know, what what are your reactions? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we're all going to have kind of similar answers since we're, you know, EM critical care. But um, I think for me as an intern, it was a really interesting year because a lot of a lot of my attendings and senior residents would joke, you know, with with COVID and nobody really knowing how to treat it and what to do. We all kind of felt like interns and we were kind of all running around the ED saying, I don't know, what do we do while trying to have these really difficult conversations with families at the same time? Um, I think kind of like an advantage to starting this year, uh, just so happened that, you know, we would get respiratory distress after respiratory distress patient in the ED. Um, so learning our resuscitation, um, I think was a huge advantage to starting right now. But like Sam said, what's so advantageous about, you know, EM and critical care is we're kind of the jack of all trades and we're the masters of resuscitation. So, you know, you, you get to know something about everything. And a lot of times I look back and I say, oh, yeah, I remember learning about this in medical school. And, you know, probably at some point or another I said, oh, why am I learning this? This won't ever matter. Um, but it really does. And I think that's something that's really cool about my field is I can always apply something that I learned while at AUA to what I'm doing right now when I'm practicing medicine. So I think that's a huge advantage to EM is you got to know something about everything and you have to be ready for anything at all times, literally all times of the day. Oh, absolutely. You never know. I mean. I, I, I'm absolutely hooked on watching, uh, you know, all the, all the series all, on N, uh, NBC and CBC and all the hospital series, Chicago Med, uh, you name it, I'm watching it, you know, all of them. Right? And there was the series called The Resident, uh, you know, and I used to watch that. And then there was one called, I think it was called Night Watch, but it was actually the, the uh, rotations that the students are doing in an EM and how the attendings were pulling their hair, the hair out with these, these uh, you know, students, medical students. And I used to watch and say, oh my God, is that what they put my students through when they took their rotations? That's terrible. You know? But as you said, it's, it's so satisfying. You know, it's so, you, know, you feel so good at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. So the questions have started to roll in. So I have one for Sam. Please explain why you chose critical care and what were your rotations like? You're, you're muted, Sam. Sorry, when I was an AUA student, I did a critical care sub I at UNC, I think, and I hated it. I hated the ICU. I, <laughs> I thought it was a little bit too much, all the micromanaging, all the data that you had to collect. It just was not a good experience at all. Um, 
And then when I started my internal medicine residency, you know, that's when you actually get to do stuff. You're not just gathering data, you're putting in orders, you're feeling like a real doctor, your white coat's longer. So you feel good. <laughs> then when I was in the ICU, I was like, actually, this is pretty cool. And I just, I love doing procedures. I love the intensity. I love being able to make decisions off the top of my head. And it's really rewarding, like how Bassett and Christie said, like you could have a patient that literally you, you think is going to die and you do everything you possibly can. You're looking up weird things, trying to work it up and you're pretty much throwing the kitchen sink at them and, you know, they get better. And sometimes you don't know why. You just know that you gave it your all and you offered the patient everything you possibly could. And that's really rewarding. And even when you don't have the good outcome, just knowing and the family members knowing that you tried everything to right. just help them um, sort of digest and come to terms with what's going on with their family member, that's special. And that's something that I really, really um, take pride in is the relationship, the rapport that I'm able to develop with family members and patients too. Right. So that's kind of why I chose it. I, I love the intensity. I think it's fun. I love doing procedures. I love bronching people. They joke about me all the time that if you stay around me too long, you might get a bronch or you might be intubated. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I like it. Okay, cool. So I said the next one is for you. Please explain why you chose neurocritical over other care and what were your rotations and residency like? Uh, so uh, initially when I picked my specialty, it was neuro, narrowed it down to neuro, and then I started my neuro residency. And, um, you know, I kind of evaluated all the subspecialties, you know, 95% of neurologists go into a subspecialty. And uh, out of that, you know, I consider movement epilepsy, but, you know, um, doing rotations in the neuro ICU and the aspect of, of internal medicine and critical care that's implied into the neurocritical care, um, that itself was very rewarding. Usually neurology patients are, are, are usually chronically just decompensating over time. This is the only field I think is where you get an immediate reward from a neuro perspective is neurocritical care. Um, rotations wise um, in, in, um, in medical school, Honestly, I did not know that I was going to go into neurology when I was doing my rotations. Right. Um, I I took the most of what I could from each rotation. Um, some were more um, helpful than others. Some were kind of waste waste of time where the physicians didn't even want to spend a lot of time with you. But but the thing is that you you absorb what you want, what you like, and you you calculate what you don't like and go with that instead of what you, you know, or you can work the other way around where what you sure. like and, and go accordingly. But for me, what I did was, because I was a pretty early AUA graduate, I, I worked with the other way where I took out what I didn't want and then worked with a pool, what I wanted and, and applied and, and uh, went according to that rather, rather than knowing exactly where I wanted to go. Questions are, questions are now, Okay, it's going, my phone is going crazy with the text coming in. So uh, basically, Christy, now I have a question, which is, I think we have someone who's an EMT watching us, who's planning on going to med school, probably a career change. So his question or her question is, please explain why you chose emergency medicine. What solidified this path of medicine for you? And how was residency, which you're in now, of course, mm -hmm. but how was residency? Yeah, I chose I chose emergency medicine for a few reasons. Um, one, I love the high acuity of it, especially in my residency. We see a ton of really, really sick patients. We get a lot of um, what we call codes coming in who are patients who are really unstable, and it's our job to resuscitate them. Um, and I absolutely love that. Um, two, I love doing procedures, just like Sam said, um, in the ED, we do a ton of procedures as well. You know, in one bed, that person needs to be intubated and another bed that this person needs a central line and you have lacks waiting for repair that are in the waiting room. There's just like always something, you know, to do. Um, and it's a very hands-on specialty. 
Um, three, I really like the art of emergency medicine. Um, you know, I think we like learn so much about the sciences and kind of thinking like medicine is really a science. And I don't think that's totally true. Um, I think that there's a really big art to what we do. And that's something that we learn just throughout our careers and something I'm really learning in residency. Um, everybody practices a little bit differently, but what's really rewarding is that we all have the same outcome um, and the same goal for the patient. Um, and it's just really fun to work with a bunch of different personalities in the ED, sure. um, knowing that we're, you know, all the, this, we all have the same end goal for the patient, essentially. Um, so those are a lot of the reasons that I chose emergency medicine. Um, I think there was another part to the question that I forgot, but um, I oh, think and how's residency going? Yes, yes. R yeah, residency is going great. Um, there, in, in EM especially, there's a huge learning curve. Because you walk in as a, you know, fresh intern, you've just graduated medical school and everything seems so great. And you're just tossed right into the thick of it, um, especially Mine. right now during COVID. So I think at the beginning, it was a little bit tough because you realize how much you don't know. And looking back now, I just had this huge spike in my knowledge and it's just steadily gaining from there. Um, but that is something you need to be aware of, especially, you know, I can speak to emergency medicine. You have to be aware that there's going to be a huge learning curve. And as long as you're open to that, I think it's a great field. That's a super answer. Yes. And I think emergency medicine, definitely, at least from what we see on television, you're on your feet and it's all go, you know, from all the, the time. Minute to the second. We're yeah. always going. So your personality also needs to, to be like that, you know, that you're able, able to handle, you know, a constant uh, flow. And like Sam says, having everything in the kitchen sink thrown at you. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 you, need, you need to have that personality to do that. Yeah. So I have been, oh my God, this is really blowing up. Okay. You guys are really popular. Uh, did you select your practice based on match rates? Any of you, all of you? I personally did not. Um, I mean, I did look at the match rates and I don't remember exactly what the numbers were when I applied, but I, I know that they weren't very high. But I just said, I always want to go into EM. I always want to be an ED doctor. Um, and throughout medical school, I kept that in mind and I made my, my application really competitive. Um, and I think if you can do that, then, you know, of course it's tempting to not look at the, the data, but yeah. don't just solely focus on the data and, you know, set your sights just on that. I agree with that. I wanted to do internal medicine before I started, um, AUA. So, but if I didn't, I don't know if that would, if the match rates would have deterred me if it wasn't favorable. Okay. That's it. Uh, I absolutely looked at match rates um, and uh, I didn't know what specialty I was going to go into be before I started AUA. So um, AUA and my rotations solidified that. And uh, but uh, I mean, reality wise, you know, where internal medicine, you know, psychiatry or pediatrics was number one. But then you, you take every opportunity that's thrown at you and then this opportunity for research came up with neuro-based and then uh, that's what led me for going to neuro and then critical care. So, yeah. Oh, well. So while the topic is what's your speciality, on the contrary, what is the one area of medicine that would be your least favorite to explore and why? Any of you, all of you? Hmm. Well, I don't want to offense, uh, offend anybody, but you know, I, I would, uh, you know, if I had to go back and repick my, I would pick anesthesia instead instead of neuro, but because uh, I think anesthesiologists uh, going to critical care are pretty well trained and, uh, you know, they get a very hands on experience from get go from lines and, and uh, intubation and stuff like that, which is, which was a, when, when I started my critical care residency, I, uh, it was a big, big learning curve because I did no procedures in residency. So, um, so that was it. But then, uh, uh, but I think uh, having to having uh, being picky on the residency, I think uh, um, depends on your scores as well. And um, I personally yeah. didn't want to go into psychiatry, um, <laughs> but I had I, I I kept my view open if I had to. Sure, sure. Sam. So the question was, what specialties you wouldn't go into, or which yeah. ones would you? Yeah. Go? 
Yeah. Um, for me, I wouldn't go into OB. I wouldn't go into pediatrics. I wouldn't go into psych. I wouldn't go into family medicine. <laughs> <laughs> It just doesn't work with my personality. Right. So, right. And, you know, I just couldn't see myself doing that. Right. <laughs> Most of my patients don't talk very much. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They no, I, I, I love the aspect of critical care. They don't talk so much. But, <laughs> but, uh, but Sam, I have a question for you. I mean, did you consider an alternative if you, if you was in internal medicine? If. Um, I didn't do internal medicine. Like when you were applying, did you think of anything alternative? Let's oh, say if you well, did get it. My answer probably isn't a good answer. If I didn't match internal medicine, I was going to be a designer because that's what I always <laughs> wanted to do. <laughs> so I was going to be done with medicine, but I knew I was going to match. Like, like how Christy did, like I did my research. I spoke to people. I used my resources. I made sure that I... I built my resume, my CV, so that I could be competitive. Like you too, Bassett. Like you you have to ask around. You have to make friends. You have to make connections. You just have to because you don't know that that may lead to an interview. And once you get the interview, all bets are off. Like it's all up to you. You got to kill yeah. it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. You have to kill it. And and you take every opportunity. Like I, I got this opportunity for research. I got, you know, before I even started residency, I had 12 publications. Um, and, and basically that helped me get those, you know, 12, uh, residency interviews. And I did get, um, actually I got more, but I only went to 12 of them. Okay. No, oh, that's, that's you and me. Huh? <laughs> I said, excuse me. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, he's being really modest here, yeah, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, I love it. Christy, what about you? If not emergency medicine, I know you said that was your focus right long, but what about if not emergency medicine? Um, actually, it will, so if I wasn't going to go into emergency medicine, the only other rotation that kind of caught my eye during medical school is actually OB, and most people hate OB, uh, yeah. but I, I, I loved it. I had such a good time doing it, but I missed the medicine portion of it because you're in OB, you're so specialized, and you're, you're really only doing yeah. that. I missed the rest of the medicine portion of it. Um, the specialties I would not have gone into probably would have been like pathology or radiology because I love patient care and I really wanted to be face to face with patients. Um, so I think that that's something like really important to think about too, is think about your personality and how you're going to fit yes. into that, you know, how you're going to fit into that specialty. And if patient care isn't for you, then, you know, maybe you want to go down one of those routes. Maybe you need to go teach at the UA. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So, so, I mean, I've already told you I'm hooked on all these programs and I'm, I'm quite a TV junkie when it comes to all these programs. Were there any, any of the TV doctors who influenced any of you? Probably not. I mean, it's probably people like me who get suckered into it. <laughs> no, not even McDreamy or, you know, George, George Clooney or, you know, not even them. Oh dear. I just realized that, that was not, that's, not realistic what anything oh, they're not. They're in, not. right but any like by when i was around like it was house but i didn't know i didn't even know what he did he just he was a diagnostic physician that's pretty much it boy how but how could we all were on house you know we yeah. watched every single episode of his and think he was the greatest thing since you know sliced bread <laughs> you yeah. know he, he was phenomenal no i i get it I, that was just random i just wanted to know if I'm the only but one. But retrospectively, talking. House and his residents went to people's houses to look for stuff. We don't do that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, but yeah, anyway. Okay. All right. So, okay. So the next question, which comes in, and this must be from one of the students Did your family or friends have any input on the speciality you selected? No. Sam's so nodding ahead. Christy's nodding ahead. That's it. None at all. No. Okay. Obviously, from a student who's getting some family pressure for whatever reason. Follow your gut. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. You know. Follow what you love because you have to do it for the rest of your life. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know how it is, and I think Basit will relate to that as well. Coming from you know that part of the world, there's always a lot of pressure on what is expected of you, what you're supposed to be doing. So yeah, I can I can see that. I'm sure that was a student. 
And the next one is very interesting. What do you hope your specialty accomplishes in the next five, 10 or 20 years? And I'm opening this up to all three of you. So, uh, you know, from a neuro perspective, you know, neuro, there's a lot of neurophobia, you know, what I call a lot of people are afraid of neurology and, and how the brain works. And there's not a lot of evidence um, in, in a lot of subspecialties in neuro. Uh, stroke is very, um, very um, evidence based because there's a lot of research going on because there's a lot of, a lot of comorbidities that, especially sure. in the United States. So. Stroke is well funded and a lot of research, but there's still a lot of room to solidify that. And, and the other aspects of neurology, there's a lot of research that is coming in. There's new, new aspects, and uh, uh, that I think in 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 you know 20 years or 30 years, you know, there would be a lot of advancements in at least my field. And then you apply critical care on top of it. That's the best of two worlds, you know. So. That's where I see my field going. That sounds really exciting. And I'm sure you're excited to learn more about what's coming out in the next 10, 20 years. You know, it's just, you know, and one of the things I think um, a very, very senior doctor once told me was that just because you leave medicine and you get your MD degree doesn't mean you stop learning. And, you know, he says, you're always reading, you're always researching something or the other. So, you right. Know, if you're not up to date, then you're not. Exactly. You're, you're not a, 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 you know, a physician that's uh, you know, provide the best care for your patients. So it, it never stops. It, it's beyond a UA, beyond your residency. It's sure. on, yeah. ongoing. Uh, sure. you know. Which I I don't think a lot of people look that far. They don't realize that that you know if the learning curve doesn't end. You know. The learning curve doesn't end, but it gets easier. So the first, sure. you know, the. It, the curve goes up very, the slope is very, but then it starts plateauing. And, you know, as you, as you expect it as you go. So it gets easier and easier and easier. And you, you overcoming that obstacle becomes much, much easier um, as you go. Sam, what about you in your area? Um, I think the world of pulmonary is, constantly evolving to being able to provide more efficient care to patients. Like, you know, there's a lot of research behind asthma and the way that we're treating asthma now. There's a lot of research going into air quality and how that could be changed and kind of provide us information on certain disease processes. Um, also with interventional pulmonology and just lung cancer in general, they just changed the guidelines for um, screening for lung cancer to start at 50 years old. And we have a lot of new diagnostic tools like the robotic Bronx. So hopefully we'll be catching cancer at the more earlier stages to be able to get to those really difficult lesions. On the ICU side, there's always <clears throat> studies going on, um, information that we have um, that we should stay on top of to be able to provide good patient care, like how Bassett was saying. So, and I feel like there's a lot of opportunities to start your own studies in the ICU because, you know, patients, like physiology doesn't always behave the way that we're taught. And I feel like there's tons to learn about patients and, you know, resuscitation, hemodynamics, and then also being able to educate by continuing to stay on top of the literature and also work on your own publications, even in the community setting, you can still do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now with COVID, I'm sure that all this yeah, research is going to be stepped lot. up. Yeah. It's going to be stepped up. Christy, emergency medicine, what would you like to see in the next 10, 15 years? I actually think the way we're going with emergency medicine is um, ultrasound is becoming a standard of care for us. And I think in the future, that in the really near future, that's just going to be true for us. Um, Right now, I mean, I use ultrasound all the time in the ED to help me make a diagnosis really quickly because um, that's 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 our job is to if you're you know unstable, we really need to kind of figure out what's going on as quickly as possible and stabilize you really quickly. Right. Um, but it's also something important to note for emergency medicine for those who want to go into it. 
it's not always our job to make a diagnosis that is, um, you know, if, if you're stable, right? It's, it's to make sure you, to rule out the scary things and to rule out the emergencies. So we're not always making a diagnosis, but when we can, um, I think ultrasound is a way that we're going to kind of help improve our skills there. Um, and there's a, there, you know, there's a fellowship for emergency medicine in ultrasound. It's a one-year fellowship right now. They're trying to get it to become ACGME, you know, accredited. Right. Um, and if you actually want to go into emergency medicine, if you're a medical student, um, getting some research or some hands-on experience with ultrasound could be a really good way to boost your resume as well. Oh, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. That's great advice, Christy. I'm, and we do have a lot of current students on the on the panel. I'm just seeing the numbers go in and there are current students on. So my, we are coming down to the wind up now. And one of the questions I had was, what was the one piece of advice you wish you had been given when you started your made for medicine journey? And what is the one question you think aspiring doctors should ask themselves before they start with the path? Sam, do you want to start? Um, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so the question was, what? The one piece of advice you wish you had been given. Okay, one piece. When of you advice. started. Um, I guess to really so learn how to, or I guess not learn how to, but try to find things to do outside of the daily grind mm -hmm. I think is really important because it's going to be a long journey there's going to be rocks along the way you know there are certain environments that you're going to be in that you may not feel like you're wanted and I think it's always good to have an outlet because when I was in medical school I not myself, but I saw a lot of students struggling with depression and anxiety. And I, I, I was shocked at some of the things that I saw and heard. And I think even a couple of people committed suicide. So oh, yeah. it, it's, it's real. And I think it's important to find an outlet and to just, just keep faith and keep at it and just trust yourself and be confident in your abilities and don't give up. Like this is what, you, if this is really what you want to do, you got to know that you got to put yourself out there. You got to put yourself on the line and it's not going to happen overnight and it may not happen the first round, but if this is really what you want, you have to find your way. And whether that means taking a year off for research or, whether that means taking an extra six months to study for step one and not taking the exam with everyone else, then you have to do that. Um, and I feel like that's something that I didn't really know. I just was kind of put myself on the schedule that everyone else was on. And yeah. if I could go back in time, then I think maybe I would have studied a little longer instead of just taking the exam because everyone else was taking it. Right. I mean, I think the outcome would have been different. Who knows? Maybe. But um, just those things, because if you don't do as well as you would want on your step one score, everyone has this this magic score in their head. Yes. Some, I think step one is different now. I don't know. But everyone has this magic score in their head that they want to get. And if you don't get that, it could it could really get you down and just yes. make you feel um, discouraged. And it's OK. Like, you don't have to be in the 99th percentile to match. You just yeah. have to have a solid resume, be dedicated and have a personality and just show that to the world and whether that's on paper or in person that's what you have to do because if you're passionate about it they need to know that and they need to know that by you representing yourself and believing in yourself and just fighting for yourself and what you want to achieve and um that's that question and then the other one was what is the one question uh, the aspiring student should ask themselves before they start is this really what I want? Is this really what I want? Because guess what? You're going to have a lot of student loan debt. And I know when I was in AUA, most of it was private loans. And yeah. um, it's a lot of hard work. It's you're going to lose friends. You're going to, you know, miss out on family events. There's going to be a lot of sleepless nights. You're going to have 
dark days, you're going to have good days. And you just have to really realize, is this really what I want? Because like I said, it could be a rocky ride. Now, I'm not saying that it's like that for everyone, but I know as a foreign medical grad, when, when I was in the mix, it was, it was kind of frowned upon. Even some of the rotations that I went to, I was sometimes not treated as an equal to some of the American grads. So you have to develop tough skin. And if you really want it, just, just trust that and just follow your gut. Christy, what would your advice be? I think actually just kind of to piggyback off of what Sam just said, um, you know, I think ask my piece of advice for medical students or people wanting to go to med medical school is asking for help is a sign of dedication, not a sign of weakness. And when you need help, ask for help. Medical school is really challenging. I don't care who you are. It's, it's a really difficult process, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally. And you, do, you need to ask for help before you need the help. Um, because if you get yourself dug into this hole that you can't get out of, you know, the outcome's not going to be what you want it to be. Um, and if that's a little bit difficult to, to digest, I think a way that you can kind of see later on in, in your career, how you ask for help in the ED, I call consultants all the time. And I say, you know, hey, this is the patient I have here. I don't know exactly, you know, what the safe disposition is for them. Or, you know, do you need this test? You know, should we admit them? Should we, should we send them home? Um, and that's me asking for help from my consultants. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, I'm helping out the patient. And yeah. at the end of the day, you in medical school, help asking for help is, is helping you to get the degree and go on to residency and fellowship and become an attending. So it's a sign of dedication, not a sign of weakness. Very well said. Very well said, Christy. Bassett? Um, what I like to add is, you know, medicine is very competitive. And if you're not... If you're not going to compete, then, you know, it may not be the right uh, field for you. So um, the what what it requires is dedication from day one. And what I, if somebody told me was it's OK to, you know, it's OK to be down at certain times. It's it's not, you know, just because, you know, you're you're in medical school or you're in residency. Um, it's OK to not know the answers and. Right. And it's expected that you go find the answers and you know where to get it, but it's okay to be, you know, not 100% correct all the time. And and uh, and what I when I first started, you know, residency and fellowship, I was like, you know, I'm 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 not at par with the with the American graduates, so I need to do harder. But the thing is that once you get to residency, yeah, you 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 can prove yourself. Uh, at, at par and that 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 you're from an international medical school it, that goes away over time um it doesn't play a, a role in in your um fellowship doesn't play i mean it, it might but it, it doesn't as long as you prove yourself and then at where you work um so um and then one i think one professor at aua told me is like and it resonates with me throughout is like she said that if you work hard now, you work less later. And that's 100% true. And uh, that, uh, if you're in medical school, if you're in AUA, use that vessel to make what you can best. And, and uh, you'll, you'll get to where you are. And also network. Don't, don't just, yes. uh, you know, don't expect that, you know, opportunities will come to you. You have to go meet people. Go meet people in the, in the specialty that you are in. You show them that you're you're a dedicated person. They will give you the opportunity. And if you don't, if you're not out there looking for it, it won't it won't be That's served to you. Yeah. I I firmly believe in networking. I I firmly believe it makes the world go round. Uh, you know, really it does. And not just in medicine, in practically every field. I know you've got to know people. You've got to know what you're doing. You know, and where you need to go to get the answers. You know, that's that's really, really important. AUA, of course, and Christy would know some of it. We have evolved a lot from when Bassett and Sam were with us. We have the ED and we have all sorts of mentoring things. And um, the latest we are, we are doing now is we are setting up mock interviews uh, for the students being done by alumni. 
because we feel that you've been through the process. You know what to ask. You know how to tell them, how to respond to answers. Uh, you know, so this is something new we are setting up. The clinical department is busy setting it up. AUA is evolving every single day. I mean, every time I look look around, we're doing something new. So, you know, the, that is going to be a huge support system for the group. Like, like Sam said, this is a tough road. There's no question about it. You know, and don't go into medicine thinking, you know, you're doing your undergrad. It's not, you know, this is, and it's a lifelong commitment. So, you know, you don't stop being a doctor. Even if you're 90 years old, you'll still be called a doctor. You know, so it's very difficult. I think we are, we are coming down to the last couple of minutes. Um, and Rina is probably wondering. Um, so I just want to thank you all again for tuning in, for coming on board, answering questions, honestly, for making us laugh. And, you know, this is, this is what it's all about. The AUA family is really, really close. We like to keep you all close. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you're going through. We want to hear what you went through because that makes us better. And it really helps us help the new students coming in. So I really appreciate it. I'm so glad all of you, you know, agreed to come on to this with this. And I was really nervous because I'm like, I'm not a doctor. What am I going to talk about specialities? You know, I, I don't know what to ask. But the questions started coming in, which means we had a very decent audience in here. So do, do keep in touch, keep safe. And if there's anything AUA can do for you, oh, by the way, the alumni magazine and the website will be launched probably next week. So you will get an email. Please, please log in. If you want a copy of the magazine, email me your address. I'll make sure it gets mailed out to you. Okay. Thank you very much to all our audience who is watching. And AUA appreciates your support. Please watch the AUA social channels to see which topic we're going to deal with next month. Sam, you had something? Okay. I thought Sam had something to say. Sorry. Thank you very much. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.